Yes, well, thank you all very much. It is good to see everyone. And uh, we're going to continue our study today in the book of Second Timothy. And we're going to be moving into chapter 3. Last days and perilous times. If you happen to have been coming to uh, Wednesday Bible studies, well, we've kind of been studying last days and perilous times on Wednesdays. But from First Timothy chapter 4. So Second um, Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three, and we're going to read the, the entire chapter again. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through seventeen. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this order they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they, uh, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly will be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. What to persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in all things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity we have to, to get together as a group of believers and study your word and uh, that we can take the truths and principles and glean from them and uh, apply them to the details of our life. And as we do so, we pray that it will truly exalt your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, the flow of chapter 3 is something that really began back in chapter 2. So let's go back to chapter 2 and read verses 19 through 26. Chapter 2, verse 19 to 26 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also useful us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strife. And the servants of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive of, uh, by him at his will. Well, we understand what Satan's policy of evil is against the, the believer in the dispensation of grace. And we saw those and how they had, because they failed to recognize what it meant to preach uh, dispensationally correct, because they did not rightly divide the word of truth, we have the, the likes of Hymenaeus, and Philetus, who were preaching a message about the resurrection, which was based on prophecy, wasn't based on mystery. And so they were having some problems. And we were learning that, that no matter what a person does, that nevertheless the foundation of God stand is sure. There's great comfort in a verse like this. Now, I never want to go off into error. But nevertheless, the foundation of God stand is sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. You know, we could uh, we could just all all stand up and, and denounce the Lord Jesus Christ today. But 
we have, we've been sealed <laughs> into the body of Christ. And no matter what we say now, others may question who we are and what we're, what we believe and where we stand, but God knoweth them that are His. The admonition that Paul says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now we should depart from all issues and all, all things that are, are, are issues that are fleshly oriented. But the issue that Paul's really getting there, he's talking about are, are issues that uh, would mar us from a service, and the context is scriptural. It's going to be doctrinal issues. It's going to be the issues of, of how important it is for believers to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. Because as we rightly divide the word of truth, we learn the truths and doctrines about our identity in of who we are in Christ Jesus. The thing that will keep us, the one issue that, that can keep us protected from Satan and his policy of evil today is that clear understanding of knowing who we are in Christ. And the person who does not act or live his life in light of who God has created us to be in Christ Jesus, they have just, wittingly or unwittingly, but whatever, they have just been taken captive at Satan's will, because that is Satan's will for his life. He does ha- he does not have to lift a finger today. In fact, he can't lift a finger against us. He do- he can't he can't call circumstances and things to go contrary. He can't force us to go in. But when we opt into that system, we are involved in his will and what he would like to do. And as Paul comes to the end of chapter two, chapter uh, cha- yeah, chapter two, he says, "And they that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive of him by his, at his will." The thing we want to recognize is the way that we recover ourselves is by remembering, by putting into practice, by applying the truth, and recognizing dispensationally who God has created us to be in His Son. But then he moves into chapter three. He says, "This know also." Know that, he says, but this know also, that in the last days perilous times should come, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, from such turn away." You know, and uh, so from here, Paul is going to begin to teach believers what to look for and what will characterize, if you will, the last days. But he says in verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. When I think of perilous times, I think of physical. (laughs) I think of, you know, my life's in danger or something is going on. Paul's got a different perspective. There's going to be another way, a vantage point, of which the Apostle Paul is going to have us to evaluate what perilous times really are. Let's know also that in the last days, perilous times should come. You know, often I know that the Apostle Paul wrote by, uh, by inspiration. He wrote what God wanted him to write. But I also think that many things that the Apostle Paul addresses in his letters were things in his epistles were things that came as a result of questions that were being asked of him by those that he was writing to. And why would you think Paul would pick this subject? This know that in the last days perilous times would come. Because people are going to be asking the question, how will we know when this age in which we live, how will we know what will characterize the end of this age? Perhaps, you know, the, what we want to do is, as we study, of course, we always want to look at a passage and note uh, distinctions and similarities. And perhaps, you know, what we need to note here is and compare and make sure we have fixed in our mind that when the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter talk about the last days, and they both talk about them, but we want to make sure we understand that they are not talking about the same last days. Because that's what much of Christianity has done today. We want to make sure that we rightly divide the word of, the word of truth. So Paul says this, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times should come. Come to Acts chapter 2. Once again, we would, we, the note of distinction is that when the Apostle Paul is going to reference the last days, 
he is going to be talking about the last days of the dispensation of grace. Why wouldn't Paul talk about the last days of prophecy? Because that's not his message. <laughs> that's not what, that is the same reason why the Apostle Peter would not talk about the last days of the dispensation of grace. Besides not knowing anything about it, because that truth hadn't been revealed to him, it wasn't given to the Apostle Peter. But they do talk about the same thing. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 20. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. A great verse in verse 21, And it shall come to pass... That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, it's a great thing to recognize in every age and every time there was the ability for people to be saved. The message has been different, but it's an issue of by grace through faith in, in every age. And there will be people when the, when the, when the sun is, uh, uh, turned into darkness and the moon into blood, there will be people who will be looking for a way of redemption, won't they? And, they don't have to work for it. They don't have to do anything. They just need to believe, of course, what God has had to say. When Peter talks about the days, what, does, what, what is it that he said is going to, hand, uh, going to highlight, if you will, or headline um, his proof in verse 17 and 18? And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Something pretty clear in it. Something miraculous, miracles, signs, and wonders, if you will. You know, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and sons and daughters prophesying, and so forth. This was going to headline what the Apostle Peter is talking about when he says it's the last day. But where did Peter learn his message from? He says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. What do you think prophets spoke about? Prophecy. So this is, when Peter's talking about it, simply enough, he's talking about the last days of prophecy. What will happen according to prophecy before prophecy ends? The last days of prophecy. What will characterize that? Well, you know, why or how can Peter be so confident? Because he is quoting what Joel had to say. Come to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon my, the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Well, when he talks about the great notable day of the Lord, you know, the day of the Lord is a period of time which concerns the Lord. And it begins at, from the prophetical uh, standpoint with the beginning of the tribulation period because that's when the purging of the nation of Israel is going to take place so that God is going to be able then to let the, uh, those who make it through the tribulation to walk into the kingdom. And so he says these are the things that are going to, to be. Now in Acts chapter 2, Peter says this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. There was the period of time. It wasn't the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, it wasn't the kingdom, but it was going to be the beginning of the purging that would, do, that would allow the, uh, the nation of Israel to walk in and to receive the kingdom. But they were going to experience, if you will, a foretaste of kingdom blessings. So the 
Holy Spirit's poured out, gifting men, going to be all sorts of things that we're doing it. But it's in preparation, if you will, for the, the judgment and the purging and the refining of that nation of Israel. Peter believed, and rightly so, that they were experience, what they were experiencing at Pentecost was the beginning of the last days. But it's the last days of prophecy. As Peter used the term, it describes the event or those things that will happen prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Now, that is also considered to be the day of the Lord because it's His day. It's His kingdom. He will be sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. But uh, unfortunately for the nation of Israel, because they would not repent, they would not change their mind about who the Lord Jesus Christ was, God is going to have to judge the entire nation to get rid of those Christ rejectors. So Joel and now Peter, they were looking for a time when the Lord Jesus Christ would return to this earth to set up His kingdom. They were simply looking for what they had been promised, what they had been told by God would take place. Their concerns for the, different, uh, concerns for the kingdom were no different now than when the Lord Jesus Christ is on the earth. Joel was looking. Peter's looking after the post during the post-resurrection ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the questions and the concern were the same for even when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the earth. Come to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. Well, be wary, because there's going to be some real deception going on in this period of time. So they're coming out, they've been visiting the temple, and perhaps what the disciples had been thinking of, would been thinking because they knew of the, of the, what the scripture had talked about, the Lord Jesus Christ setting up his throne in Jerusalem. Perhaps what they were thinking, is this the temple? Is this where Christ is going to set up his kingdom and set up his government? Come, look at these, look at these rooms, look at these buildings. We can already imagine. This part of Christ's government working out of here. This part of Christ's government working out of there. And they came to show in the buildings. They're going to take a look at this because no doubt they could they say this could very well be the place where Christ is going to set up his throne. So they were excited about what could take place. And so in their excitement, they came to him and they said, and Jesus went out, verse 1, and departed from the temple and the disciples came and said, look at all this. Because they could, I'm sure, they, I'm thinking, so they're imagining how wonderful and how glorious it will be when the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling the earth from, from Jerusalem. But Christ is going to use this time to teach to his disciples some things that are going to be really important for them to know. He says, you know, they came out, they're going to show them, no doubt, the emphasis on, on the kingdom. And in verse 2, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. So guess what? It won't be this. It won't be Solomon's temple. It's not going to be this building because remember what prophecy has taught us. This building is going to be destroyed. So they depart out and they leave, leave Jerusalem. Christ goes out to the, to the Mount of Olives. They've been thinking about this and they have some additional questions, if you will, some things they want to ask the Lord for clarification. It says, And he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, you know, their question is the same, perhaps, as what those were asking um, uh, Paul, the believers of Paul's day. Tell us, what's, going, what's it going to be like during the last days? The, and his, the, Christ's disciples are wanting to know the same. What will it be like in the last days of prophecy before the kingdom has come, before the Lord Jesus Christ takes his uh, rightful place of king of the nation of, of, of Israel? And so the questions are not out of concern for the weather here. They're not out of concern for anything. Well, they want to know a very practical thing 
And uh, the, the real question was, when is the Lord going to set up? When are you going to set up your kingdom? Look at verse 14. Or verse 13 and 14. It says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Well, what does Christ just say? How, do we going to, how are we going to know? What, how can we know when the end of the age and the world and prophecy as we know it, that it's going to come to the end? He says, When the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world. So, you know, we know now that that's not going to take place until after the catching away of the church, the body of Christ now. And we know that that's not going to take place uh, through the, uh, and, uh, but it will be uh, facilitated, if you will, by the 144,000 uh, that are going to be preaching during the tribulation period. So, again, they were, what they were wondering was, when's the tribulation going to end and when is Christ going to set up his kingdom? The end that they're concerned with is ultimately could be characterized by when will this earth and the rule and the satanic influence of Satan and his rule over this earth, when's it going to be broken? Because it's the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to break it. Come to Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Right here is a, a passage of Scripture, which is so it, it is straightforward, but it's something that can revolutionize our thinking about the world events and what's going on today as we see the calamity of, of what's going on in the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Well, in whom the God, it says in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Well, you know, we understand, come to Ephesians chapter 2, we recognize that today, even though this world was created by God, and even though this world is a represent, was created way back in eternity past, if you will, by, uh, by the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize that it is no longer under God Almighty's control. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know, I, I do have a, a desire, a great desire, uh, whether it's me or some other person who understands what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace, but sometime right after a natural calamity, I wish they could find a grace pastor somewhere who would say, well, what happened? He says, and it wouldn't be, well, you know, God did this or God did that or whatever. He's, he's punishing these people or he's doing that. But to be able to hear somebody say, well, you know, that just reflects a world that has been contaminated by sin. This is just what happens in a world. This isn't how God wanted the earth to be. But that Satan, way back in time past, when he usurped, as Lucifer, when he usurped the authority that God gave him. You know, we just we know now what God's plan of redemption for this earth is. But it hasn't been redeemed yet. And so it's still working under the curse and the influence of Satan. He says, "...wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world." According to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who are the children of disobedience? That's the unbeliever. And the unbeliever has a tie and an allegiance to Satan and his policy of evil against all that God is going to do. And so, of course, this will, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, this will cause the, the cease of satanic authority. And uh, we'll begin the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. 
Matthew 24 and verse 3. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, from verses 4 to uh, verse 24, Christ is going to answer and give them some answers to their questions. And in, in V, tell, you know, it says, tell us when shall these things and so forth be. The first answer Christ gives them is a warning, verse 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, that's what, uh, you know, the ultimate deception is going to be when Antichrist comes and says, I'm the one. I'm, I'm Christ. That guy you crucified all those years ago, he was an imposter. I'm the real one. But he's not going to be the only one coming. There's going to be many come. There's going to be, there'll be uh, deceivers coming in the name of the Lord. And there will also be these things, verses 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquake in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. You know, when you think about this, you hear all the physical harm and calamity and difficulties of people going through. Well, what age and what time hasn't there been that? We have to be careful to recognize that, that, this, that what we're reading about today may be Satan's policy of evil against God, but it's not working because it's God's timetable. He said there's, a, and there's going to be a difference in what's being accomplished today. Today, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and tsunamis and, and sick, all these things, what is it? It's just living in a sin-cursed world. But there's going to be that time when these folks, when Christ says, when you see these things, he said, all these are just the, are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. I can imagine during, I mean, the, the, the different times that the, the nation of Israel and Jewish people have been subjected to wholesale slaughter and the Holocaust and all this. I'm sure people are pointing at these verses and saying, this must be the time. Look at look at this. I mean, we're being we're being delivered to death. And they shall kill you, and and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel, of the kingdom, shall be preached. What is the one verse here and the one phrase where we can look at and we can say, see, this isn't going on today because we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We're preaching the gospel of the grace of God. We're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so, therefore, that cannot be of this time. Come to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. The message that we preach during the dispensation of the grace of God, that dispensation of grace, is not the gospel of the kingdom. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. It says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Well, according to this, if this the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel that Paul's talking about were the same, then the Lord Jesus Christ should have ascended. He should have been on His throne. The tribulation period would have, would have been over. But we recognize and we see that things are indeed different. So we recognize, say, Peter who is a part of all of that which is going on in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 24. He's able to draw from this special time and revelation that he spent with the Lord Jesus Christ to know what the last days of prophecy were going to look like. He learned it from, from Joel. It was confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, um, so Paul knew without any doubt that the days that they were living in, in, in the book of Acts, were truly the last days of, of prophecy. So now we want to be careful not to confuse this with what Paul was saying 
in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because we know uh, there are those who don't distinguish the difference between Matthew and the message going on in Matthew and the message going on in, in, uh, in 2 Peter. I mean, 2 Timothy. And so they, they, they mix and mingle the message that was being preached by Peter and the message which is being preached by, by Paul. And uh, since we've just been reading what Christ told his disciples, what would be the signs of the last days of prophecy, we'll see what Paul said. And it talked all about physical issues. And that's what we don't want to miss here. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5 again. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. This is what I... You see, Peter could have said this, couldn't he? In Matthew 24. Lord Jesus Christ could have said, It's going to be perilous because people are going to be out to kill you. But Paul says it's perilous. And he says this, verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Well, you know, so what, we, what, what would be missing here? <laughs> the emphasis on personal physical physical uh, calamity. Paul makes no mention to that. The perilous times that Paul is referring to are going to be marked by, uh, not by natural disasters, but by spiritual uh, issues. What's going to make them per, uh, perilous is there will be people during this age and this period of time who are not going to be careful with what's going on, and they're going to be sucked in to the untruths that are being preached. And it's going to cause many to spend eternity cast alive into the, uh, into the lake of hell, if you will. Issues that are going to be today are going to be marked by questions of morality. And statements like this are going to are speak to the depravity of, of man's uh, nature. And the reason for the difference is Paul is referencing the last days of the dispensation of grace. Today we're living in the dispensation of grace, of course. And before the last days of prophecy can begin again... What has to happen before prophecy can begin? Well, the dispensation of grace has to come to an end, and that which it will. And there's a great event which is going to absolutely clearly mark that uh, this age in which we live is over, and it's called the, the catching away, also referred to today by much of the church as the rapture. The rapture is where the Lord Jesus Christ comes for the church, but he's in the air. The last days of the dispensation of grace, the day that it ends, Christ comes for the church in the air. The, the end of, the, of, uh, of prophecy is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and puts his feet physically on Mount Olives. And those are different. You know, we like to think about that and we recognize what? Things that are different? They're just not the same. That is so, you know, I, 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 every time I think about this, I say, you know what clears this up? It's just knowing they're different. Makes it easy to understand and knowing they're not the same. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 13 down through chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall, shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with the words that you're not going to go through this and that we're not going to, uh, if, if the Lord comes back, those that have died before are not going to miss their blessings of being united with their Lord. But of the times of the seasons, brother, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not... In darkness, 
that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and, and uh, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of, of darkness. Well, so we recognize, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about the catching away of the believer. He says, there's some things about prophecy I don't even have to teach you because you know perfectly those things. And they were able to make the distinction between prophecy and mystery. And the event that separates the two is the catching away of the believer. The reason why this is so important for us to understand is, without Paul's preaching about the mystery, we would not have any hope from being delivered, if you will, from, from, the, uh, from the wrath to come. He says in, uh, in verse 8, he says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of what? Well, chapter 5 starts the truth about the tribulation. He says that we have no part in that. You know, it would take a very active imagination if we were to try to take what Paul says about the dispensation of grace and make it match the details of what Peter's saying and talking about, as well as Joel and others, about prophecy. So we can, with confidence, take the things that Paul is teaching to heart. He's talking and speaking about issues that directly affect us as members of the church, the body of Christ. And so Paul warns us of this. Come back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so Paul teaches us about this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times should come. You know, almost every time we would go through last days here, I'm going to want to be careful to say the last days of prophecy or the last days of the dispensation of grace. But the reason why Peter and Paul didn't, because they were, they were identified with their message. No one was confusing what Paul was saying about the last days, as men do today. Because Paul was identified with his message as being the uh, preaching the, the gospel of the grace of God, while Peter was with, identified with preaching the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the circumcision. So how do we know they're perilous? Well, we, we, we've read it. We know it's going to be all those social and moral issues, what men are going to do and what they're going to believe. And it's going to come all the way down and we get verse, uh, verse 5. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, laden with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. Having a form of godliness. You know, we think about having a form. Well, there's a pattern, there's a structure. And when you think about having a form of godliness today and the pattern and the structure, what comes to mind? Religion? Denominationalism? Do they have a form? Do they have a pattern? But what they do is, and, and, and many, that, you know, and I certainly don't think we ought to judge the motives of, of men and why they preach what they do. More than likely, they've just been duped by somebody else and they don't even know it. But here they are, they've got the form, and, and, and in many cases... Week after week after week, they're preaching issues of godliness. But they're preaching it from the wrong perspective. They're preaching godliness based on thou shalt and thou shalt not. They're preaching godliness based on performance. They're preaching godliness of saying if you come to church, if you, if you pray, if you study your Bible, and if you make sure you put something in the offering plate as you go, you are then godly because you're doing what God would want you to do. Well, it sounds good, doesn't it? It's just not true. It's scriptural, it's just not dispensational. So the form of godliness today, all this will worship, all this legalistic, all this idea, you know, Paul says when we come into contact with something which is not dispensationally correct, which isn't dispensationally sound, he says withdraw. He says reject it. He says do it. I know there are those today who, who are involved in ministries and because they have no other place to, uh, to fellowship. But uh, I think Paul's saying separate from them. He's saying separate from them. Uh, what would be God's design would be start your own church and, uh, and so forth. It would be says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You know, the idea of denying the power. 
You know, Paul has a message, and Paul certainly has a call for the believer to walk holy. He says it, chapter 2, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look at Titus chapter 2, because he preaches the issues in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. He says in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good work. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. When he says that speaking of Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So much of religion today and denominationalism fail to recognize where the empowerments of grace can take you and what they can do for you. All, so much of what is, is done is, is based on self-will, self-performance, and a self-governing in how we behave ourselves. He says, but he gave us himself for us that he might redeem us, that he might be the one. We need to yield to that, don't we? Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 3 and 4. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might... Take us to heaven when we die, that we'll spend eternity with Him? He says, no. He who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. You know why I know that, uh, that He gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil world, and I know He's not speaking about eternity? Present evil world. And we're still here, aren't we? <laughs> you know, if He's going to deliver me, if, if He's in power, He would have delivered us. If it meant... Out there in eternity, we would have stepped out there into eternity. Because I'm telling you what, other than that, we haven't been delivered from this present evil world. But we recognize that we have the ability and the availability of the empowerment of living above the temptations of this world. And it's because of recognizing our identity, the Lord Jesus Christ, and recognize that He gave Himself for us. That He might redeem. That He can do that. He gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Come back to Second Timothy chapter 3. The issues and the powers of, of godliness, if you will. And living a godly life in the dispensation of grace. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 5 and 6, "...having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they, which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with, the, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust." Well, you know, this seems like a strange verse, doesn't it? But it's not hard to grasp the meaning if we don't just say, I wonder what this verse, and put it out there on a the board and just stare at that one verse over and over again, and say, I wonder what that verse means. Well, because there are a couple of verses before and a couple of verses after, which certainly help put it into perspective of what Paul's talking about and godliness and what's going on in those who have the form. Paul's going after those who are using their message and their ministries to go after people who are vulnerable. He says we need to be careful of those. There will be people in the last days of the dispensation of grace that you cannot trust. There will be some who will do anything and say anything to anyone even if it's using the name of the Lord. We say most people today in denominationalism are just there because they believe what somebody else told them. But to say that there's nobody <laughs> defrauding people on purpose, that, that, would, that wouldn't be a fair assessment either, would it be? So even to using the name of the Lord to defraud others, to take advantage and to manipulate and to achieve goals. Verse 7 says, Ever learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. If someone is learning, but not coming unto the knowledge of the truth, what are they learning? 
They're learning ways to manipulate. <laughs> They're learning ways to deceive. They're learning ways to, to further their own agendas. They're learning how to go in and take cack to silly women who are laden with sin and desires. You know, sin and desire doesn't have to be, sounds almost like it's a, some sort of physical compromise what's going on here. But it's people who are being influenced in an improper way in understanding what God is doing today. There will be those who will have the form of godliness and they will learn that they're never going to be able to come into the knowledge of the truth because they reject the truth. Not because God's not going to let them have it. Because they deny the power of godliness. You know, we'll never be godly simply because we look godly or because we say we're godly or any of the things like that. We'll not be godly without knowing the truth. That's what makes a person godly. Knowing the truth and then, of course, living by that truth. And it's not because the truth is unavailable, because we know the truth is available to all. God says, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth? But he's going to hide it from somebody? You know, that's not what God's all about. God's wanting people to know what the truth is today. So, verse 8 and 9. It says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So they have the truth available to them. What are they doing? They're resisting it. They're rejecting it. And so forth. He says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Even uh, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning faith. But said, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest, shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Well, who is just Janus and Jambres? Well, it's believed that they're those magicians that withstood Moses and Aaron when they were before Pharaoh. Come to Exodus chapter seven. Exodus chapter seven. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 10. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went up unto Pharaoh, and they, did, and, uh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. So Moses and Aaron, they go before Pharaoh, and this is what God told them to do. When they get there... Of course, they're going to say, let my people go. But what Aaron does is he throws his rod down and becomes a snake, becomes serpent. And, uh, and so, verse 11 and 12. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So here they come. They're down there, and maybe they got word that Moses and Aaron were there. Maybe something was going on. And uh, so Mo, uh, Pharaoh summons them up. And they get up there, and they walk into the room, and Pharaoh says, See this? Can you do that? And they're thinking, hey, Boy, this ain't going to be bad at all. We can do this without even trying. And they throw their rods down. Verse 12. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But... Aaron's rods swallowed up their rods. Wow, I said, man, you know, as Janus and Jambres withstood uh, Moses and Aaron. They withstood them. They came in and they did. You know, the thing was, that should have immediately put Pharaoh on notice that, you know what? I need to, I need to deal differently with the children of Israel. I need to let those folks go. But look what verse 13 said. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And so he, uh, he, it didn't work. So they resisting the truth. They're hardening their heart. And we know that Pharaoh hardened his heart as he continued to resist the truth of God. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart as he continued to push Pharaoh with the truth. But this was the problem. They, you know, they, they, they would not uh, receive and believe what God was going to do. And Pharaoh is going to understand and see, but he's going to resist the truth, and he's not going to yield. Come back to Second Timothy chapter three. Now we kind of see, so okay, now how is that going to relate, if you will, to how things are going to be in the last days of the dispensation of the grace of God, the last days 
of the age in which we live in. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. It says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Well, the personal pronouns, I trust we can keep them straight when we go through it. Those who are leading captive, silly women. Those who have the form and the of, of, of godliness, but are denying the power of. Those that are using the truth of what God would have for men to know today, but, uh, but uh, twisting it to their own advantage. You know, in the end, guess what? They're going to be exposed as fakes and frauds. And they're going to be exposed as weak and powerless against God, just as Janice and Jambres was. In the end, whose name is proclaimed as victor in the, in the children of Israel escaping out of Egypt? Well, God Almighty is. And it's going to be the same at the end of the dispensation of the grace of God. Can you imagine? You know, there's going to be some scrambling. There's going to be some things that are going on. But when the church, the body of Christ, is caught away... And those, those uh, pretenders that are still left here, well, they're going to be exposed, aren't they, as fakes and frauds. They'll be doing some scrambling, no doubt, trying to uh, put a spin on it, but nonetheless will be exposed. You know, so we come along, and, and so verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. Now, verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, and so forth. Paul says there are some deceivers out there. I'm not going to recommend there's anybody in this room. I, I would never do it, but I would never hold myself out to be an example. Paul says this is what Janice and Jambres was like. This is what the false prophets and the false teachers in the dispensation of grace at the end of the last days of the church of the dispensation of grace. He says, but thou hast known me. Paul says, I am a pattern. And I think Paul can hold himself out to be a pattern. He kind of led by example, didn't he? But so we come along. He says, but Timothy, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You have known my manner of life. You've known my uh, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, in Iconium, and at Lyst uh, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord shall deliver me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Apostle Paul, if we were to take the time today and to go back and to look into the book of Acts. If you want to read it, just read Acts chapters 13, 14, 15, and so forth in there. When he was in, when he was in Antioch, he had to be, they, 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 uh, they took counsel to kill him and they fled. When they go to Iconium, he says they, they were, they, they had moved against him and, uh, they stoned him thinking that he was going to be dead. And then he goes to Lystra and, uh, and things and so forth. You know, the apostle Paul suffered much persecution. He suffered much at the hand of his countrymen, if you will. Well, what he did, he withstood them all. He says, Timothy, you have known who I am. You've known my doctrine. You know my manner of life. You know my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. So, you know, today, when we have two examples that we can look to in life, we can look to the life of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. We look at his earthly ministry. We don't follow Jesus of Nazareth in doctrine. But you know what? He was a great example of one who did not yield and, and, and withstood the pressures of temptation. We can look to the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul also did as, as well. You know, eventually the Apostle Paul had, and uh, was over, overcoming all this. And he is remaining true and faithful to the ministry that was going on. And he says, Timothy, the persecution, verse 11, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and uh, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now, you think the Apostle Paul was somehow delusional in saying, I really didn't get persecuted? <laughs> How did the Lord deliver Paul? 
from those persecutions. You know, certainly didn't deliver him. He did not, not through divine intervention, was it? But the Apostle Paul was able to keep his mind and focus on what was going on and what was really important in life. And he says, you need to know this because, he says, you need to understand this because, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, shall suffer persecution. Well, when we think about this, anybody feel shortchanged? You know, I'm not saying I feel shortchanged, but I don't, I've not experienced anything like the Apostle Paul did. And I still know that in many ways and many times, I haven't remained as faithful as he did with less persecution. But we're reminded of this, and we, and we think back and we say, you know, how should we respond to that? You know, way too many times today, when believers begin to go through some sort of trial and struggle, perhaps they, they begin to pray, and they're waiting to say, Lord, do something for me, deliver me, help me, intervene, do something. Well, does he? He doesn't intervene, and yet he has given every single believer every tool, every power that they need to overcome it. If, the, if, if there was anybody that God was going to alter physical circumstances for, you would have thought it would have been the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? Paul says, I've been delivered out of him. He says, I, I just, you know, they beat me, they stoned me, they thought I was dead. And here's Paul laying on the ground. Everybody looked around there and said, we think he's dead. And he gets, stands up and he says, boy, that hurt. Well, let's go on back in the city. We've got work to do tomorrow. <laughs> and there he goes. He's right back at it. And he goes on, he visits a couple of cities. And he says, well, that, okay, let's just go right back through those areas which we received the most persecution. Apostle Paul had purpose and he had, and he had meaning. Uh, there was meaning to his, his life. Persecutions, affliction, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, while persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You know, I think we can recognize that Paul, if he was relying on his own strength, he wouldn't have been able to say that. It would have been overwhelming. But he looked to the strength, that inner strength that all believers have access to, and he delivered him. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But Timothy, you know who I am. And you need to continue. You know, continuing implies that you've already started. And he says, you continue in those things. Keep on. Thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We'll pick up here next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for the truth of Your Word and the great example that we have of one like the Apostle Paul who, when faced with personal calamity, He relied on the strength that, that he already had inside of him. That which was fortified by your word that was able to empower him and enable him as it will do for us. Truly furnished unto all good works. We'll give you the praise and glory for all that's said and done. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. All right. Christ is all that he claimed to be. Christ is all that He claimed to be. I'm so glad that He lives in me. My hope of glory, yes, He is. For He is mine and I am His. Amen. Well, it's certainly good to see you all this morning. And uh, look for you online tomorrow night if you have opportunity. 7 p.m. Grace Bible Studies.
We want to thank uh, Ephesians for us and doing some admin for us as well. We thank you for that.